All righty. Um, okay, so let's get our hour kicked off. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, Anticipating OHT Incorporation, the second in a series of events presented by VHA Home Healthcare to connect Ontario health teams and to share information and learning. So my name is Catherine Nichol, and I'm VHA's president and CEO. So I would like to start us off by acknowledging that we are living and working on Indigenous land. Personally, I'm joining uh, this afternoon from the Toronto area, which is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. Thank you. So I know we are all uh, familiar, some of us very familiar with the path forward, the new direction introduced by Ontario's Ministry of Health in November, uh, that confirmed the government's commitment to the Ontario Health Team model, but also offered new direction in two key areas. The first, uh, making sure that OHTs are built to last through the creation of new not-for-profit corporations to uh, manage and coordinate OHT activities. And the second, to position them to deliver better patient care through the phased introduction of integrated clinical pathways. So today's symposium is actually focused on the first new direction, the creation of not-for-profit corporations to support integrated accountability and funding. And we know that while we await further direction, many of us uh, are thinking about what we might do to educate ourselves, what we might do to prepare our teams, and of course, wondering what others are doing. And that's really what brings us uh, all here together this afternoon. So very quickly, VHA is a not-for-profit home care provider serving a number of communities across Ontario. And this um, sort of span in geography really affords us the opportunity to work with many OHTs and to participate in different governance dis uh, discussions across those OHTs. So we're in a good position to connect people, uh, to share their experience and to share how different OHTs are approaching the changes that are underway. We uh, hosted our first OHT Governance Symposium last May, so it's been just over a year. Uh, at that time, we focused on exploring OHT governance models and are really pleased to be hosting this second session um, and really, really pleased to see almost 300 people register. So these symposiums really are an opportunity to learn from an expert or experts, to hear from health leaders across the province, and in particular, those who are really embedded in the OHT work um, they're the ones that are living and breathing the changes every day and really blazing the path forward for all of us. So thank you to our panelists uh, for being here this afternoon to share your on the ground experience. So without further ado, I welcome all of you to the symposium. I uh, hope that you find it to be of value and I will now turn it over to my colleague, Lauren Black, who's VHA's General Counsel and Privacy Officer to introduce our distinguished panel. Over to you, Lauren. Thank you, Catherine, and good afternoon to everyone. Before we get into our program, I wanted to go through some quick housekeeping items. Firstly, I just wanted to make everyone aware that this session is being recorded for the purpose of being able to review and share it with those who were not able to make it today. Secondly, uh, just a quick reminder that our panelists are providing their comments for your general information and reference purposes only. Nothing to be presented should be construed as legal advice or a specific direction to be followed. In terms of our session format, we'll start today's discussion by hearing general information about what it means to be incorporated and how the corporate governance model is structured. We'll then hear about some specific governance models being used by three different Ontario health teams and how they're planning to get ready to implement the path forward when the time comes. After we hear from all of our panelists, there will be a question and answer period. And in the interim, we encourage you to post questions in the chat and we'll do the best we can to address as many as possible. So with that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Heather Passioni. Heather is a partner at the law firm of Borden Ladner Gervais, and she has particular expertise in corporate governance, education, and thought leadership for not-for-profit not corporations like hospitals and Ontario health teams. Heather has co-authored Provincial Templates and Guidance on Collaborative Governance, 
uh, such as the Collaborative Decision-Making Agreement, or CDMA, that is used by many of our OHTs and shared through the RISE platform. Heather, over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, I really appreciate you having me here today. I know I'm going to learn a lot um, from the on-the-ground experience. And I could talk about this all day, uh, but I have 10 minutes, so let's get into it. Uh, first slide, uh, we're going to start by level setting. What is the current state in terms of governance for OHTs? Next slide. Um, so many of you will know the Ontario Health Team uh, concept was introduced in 2019 with the Connecting Care Act. The first bullet here is the CCA definition of an OHT. The objective has been movement toward a full and coordinated continuum of care for a defined population linked to uh, what the ministry has called the quadruple aim, right? Better patient and population outcomes, better patient family and caregiver experience, better provider experience, and better value. Uh, so currently, a number of OHTs have been approved for development, although none have been formally designated yet under the CCA. That's something that's mentioned in the Path Forward document. Uh, currently, most OHTs are not themselves legal entities. You'll hear about an exception later, but for the most part, OHTs are groups of legal entities, uh, team members or partners or other terminology can be used who have voluntarily come together under a decision-making agreement or arrangement. And that's what we call the CDMA. The CDMA provides for now the rules of the road in terms of how OHT partner entities have been developing as OHTs making decisions. Uh, coming to the CDMA itself was voluntary and governance so far has been described by the ministry as self-determined and fit for purpose. The approach has served well in OHT formation and development, allowing for voluntary um, coming together, formation of trust and relationships, and a focus on the benefits to the system and individual partners of integrated care and governance. But there are implications to this current structure. So I mentioned, most OHTs are not incorporated. So they're not independent legal entities. They don't have the ability to enter into contracts or agreements in their own name. And the power that the OHT has is the power given to it uh, contractually under that decision-making agreement or arrangement. There may be something that is called the governance table, lots of different terminology for that as well, but that is not a formal uh, legal corporate board of directors governed by corporate law. Again, rights are given to that table by contract and the people sitting on of it don't owe a formal fiduciary duty to act in the best interests of the Ontario health team. But of course, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later, you know, the best interests of partners in an OHT are likely to align with each other um, to a, a good degree um, in terms of what's best for the system. Okay, next slide. And we've already heard our focus today is on the ministry guidance from last November on OHT governance. Um, I exerted here some highlights, right? Um, you're gonna have a new not-for-profit corporation created for the purpose of managing and coordinating OHT activities. OHT member organizations maintain their existing legal um, accountabilities. Um, and importantly, further details to support the incorporation process and expectations related to governance and decision making practices will be provided. OHTs should await Ministry and Ontario Health Guidance and Supports, and the Ministry and OH will work with OHTs to assess readiness. What does the OHT um, guidance on governance mean? So let me unpack that for you over the next few minutes. Next slide. The ministry guidance is signaling that OHTs will be not-for-profit corporations governed by the Not-for-Profit Corporations Act. You may have heard that um, referred to as ANCA. OHTs will be legal entities as opposed to those current groups of legal entities bound together by agreements or arrangements. And it will be the OHT itself that is responsible for OHT initiatives as opposed to the partner organizations collectively. 
Um, the future state will have implications. So very briefly, um, instead of those CDMAs, uh, collaborative decision-making agreements or arrangements, OHTs will have governing documents, um, you know, articles of incorporation, bylaws, agreements, governance policies. And instead of collaboration tables that are self-defined, there will be boards of directors and corporate members as regulated under the governing legislation, ANCA. Um, the OHT directors will owe fiduciary duties to the Ontario Health Team Corporation, as opposed to any other organization or entity that they may be affiliated with. Once incorporated, the OHTs will be independent corporations. So again, that means they'll be able to enter into contracts in their own name, and they will be making decisions independent of their partner organizations, the implications just on the sort of legal and regulatory side, um, some high level um, thoughts there, you know, things like corporate filings and banking and financial reporting and auditing, all of those obligations that currently sit with not-for-profit organizations, corporations will apply. Um, what does this really mean? So first of all, in terms of the governance framework and corporate structure, there are lots of different ways to structure a not-for-profit corporation in terms of who sits on the board, who's represented on the board, who the corporate members will be, and what rights might be retained by corporate members. So for example, would there be independent directors, um, nominees from partner organizations to sit up on the board of directors? Would there be a combination of both and in what kind of ratio? Uh, what level of representation is going to be appropriate from each partner organization or from a sector within the OHT that is currently forming? Um, will some partners participate not by sending people up to the board, but contractually as service providers or under member agreements? Um, there's going to be a number of relevant considerations when working through these questions around governance structure, including things like managing potential conflicts of interest um, and best interests of the organization and uh, balancing off sort of equitable decision-making. What we're thinking about there is, you know, the level of participation or representation or not of partner, uh, current partner or team members in an OHT on the eventual uh, board of directors or mem uh, membership structure. Another question, uh, will the organization be a registered charity permitted to receive donations? Lots of other questions, but this is sort of to get your brain thinking about where this might be going. And back to the ministry, the ministry may or may not have direction on some or all of these issues. Um, it, it, as well as this last bullet here, how will the incorporation actually work from a practical perspective? You know, around how it expects OHTs to come together, the ministry, to make decisions around this governance framework and structure and how to implement it. So back briefly to the ministry guidance. Um, OHTs at this point have been asked to await ministry and Ontario health guidance and supports because aspects of the process and the framework and the structure um, maybe other things as well, may or may not be prescribed by the Ministry in Ontario Health. What can OHTs think about in the meantime? Here's some stuff to keep you thinking. Obviously staying informed as to any other guidance that comes out from the Ministry in Ontario Health. Continuing, of course, with the status quo. Um, you know, under your CDMA, under your project agreements, implementing whatever um, initiatives that you currently have, which helps, of course, to continue building trust and relationships amongst your team members. Um, leveraging the CDMA decision-making processes, the thought here is, you know, as you move and work toward incorporation, subject to what you hear from the ministry and Ontario Health, um, the, the decision-making framework in your CDMA can provide um, a structure for deciding what governance structure do we want? Um, what kind of representation do we want? What naming do we want? All of those decisions that are gonna have to be made to the extent that um, there isn't guidance on how those are made, the CDMA um, structure for decision-making and governance can be used. 
thinking ahead, sort of some of these ideas about how the governance framework might work. Um, and also from the perspective of your current CDMA, are there things that are working well in terms of how you've come together, in terms of your representation, decision-making structure? Are there things that could be improved? Um, doing a little bit of an audit on how it's gone and how that might be improved in the context of an incorporated OHT, something to think about. Um, and then thinking ahead to kind of the nuts and bolts, the fact that the OHT will be able to enter into funding agreements, employment agreements, service agreements. Um, and, you know, thinking about timing, you know, are you renewing? What, what's the timing going to be in terms of when you get more guidance and when you're able to incorporate versus um, what's your timeline for renewing contracts or entering into new ones? And then some of the stuff I talked about in terms of, you know, new obligations will come regulatory compliance, um, employment requirements if you become an employer. And um, most importantly, consulting your legal counsel, um, whoever that may be, as you move forward toward incorporation. And the last slide is just a little bit of a takeaway that I have here. Um, thinking about the role of OHT partner boards. This is a publication that we have um, at BLG. And it talks about um, what can directors in um, partner of OHTs be thinking about as you um, move toward um, not just potential incorporation, but as you move through the development process. Um, and it's something that you can access and sort of start thinking about. And we have these five dimensions. So what's the role of you know, the OHT partner um, it is a little bit different than the role of the person actually sitting on an OHT governance table. And that's what we put together here. Um, so that may be where you're kind of coming from as a participant in this webinar, and it may be something that is uh, useful to you. So I'll stop there. Hopefully I haven't taken up too much time and I know we'll um, talk for questions in a few minutes. Thanks very much, Heather, for your very informative overview and the helpful resources. Our next speaker is Scott Cordes. Scott is the Executive Director of the London Intercommunity Health Centre, providing health and social services to many of London's most marginalized community members. And he has over 20 years of board governance experience in the not-for-profit sector. In addition to many other important roles that Scott plays, he is currently serving as the co-chair of the London Middlesex Primary Care Alliance as the primary care representative on the Middlesex London OHT, and he co-chairs that OHT's governance committee. Scott will be sharing with us today some of the experiences and governance prep work being done in Middlesex, London. Scott, please go ahead. Thank you so much and good afternoon to everyone. So I'm gonna do a little bit of a, a review of what our current governance model is, then get into some of the things we've been doing to get ready for incorporation. And then finally give a little bit of commentary around challenges and opportunities uh, from my perspective as, a, as an executive leader uh, serving in the OHT. So next slide. So a little bit of context, this probably feels similar uh, to many of you. And if, for us, it was way back in 2019 in the beginning, uh, in the before times. Uh, we were in a place of, I would say, low trust, lots of history, myth, and lore to overcome in our local health system. But what really counterbalanced that is tremendous hope and optimism for uh, a different way of working together and really a genuine desire to work differently. Uh, and uh, our leadership group came around, chose to move to the light and uh, saw those as uh, the things that inspired us at the start. So really influenced our governance um, approach, that, that context. So we didn't name it as such at the time, but really we, we've uh, landed on a collective impact framework as, as we, uh, we move through the work, which is really a bunch of independent organizations choosing to voluntarily work together towards a, a common purpose. And uh, we developed comprehensive leadership accountability and governance principles and spent a lot of time thinking about how to balance the the power um, and voice within our OHT. So landed on a consensus-based decision make, uh, making framework. And then also sort of getting to the, the trust issue, I quite purposely selected a primary care organization, which is the, which is the 
um, one of our local family health teams to be our, our transfer payment agency, because uh, as many of you may have felt in that beginning, there was a, just a little bit of fear of the, the power of hospitals and uh, wanting to balance that. Um, why? So having a community organization as the TPA holder. So what, what do we look like right now? Next slide. So our, our governance table or whatever, we, we all have so many different words for it. We call it our coordinating council. And I've got a little bit of a pretty picture down the row in a couple of slides to, so you can see it. But we landed on developing what we called cluster representation, which is various sectors participating uh, in the OHT, uh, electing representatives to uh, represent them at our, at our coordinating council table. So partner organizations, but then also a very strong uh, commitment to patient and client care partner voices. So our coordinating council, it's co-chaired by a health sector leader and a patient partner, a patient family caregiver partner. And that coordinating council provides strategy, uh, strategy and oversight for the, for the, the work of uh, the OHT. The actual mucky muck of doing the work, we've got, uh, we've got working groups and a, a backbone team or an operations support team. So working groups, uh, we've uh, really doing the co-design and leading the strategy and implementation of the various uh, pathways that are being developed and just the collective work of the organization. And then we've got an operations team um, that's, uh, you'll see in a moment, it's quite very blessed to have a, a nice size operations team. So we have both uh, dedicated staff uh, and leadership that uh, work kind of wake up every morning thinking about and working just on the OHT's work. And then we also have expertise that's seconded from some of our, our partner uh, agencies as well. And that team coming together really manages the, the work uh, day to day. Uh, next slide. So this is the, the, it's not really pretty, it's a bunch of boxes, but it gives you a visual representation of how we're, we're clustered. So a lot of the traditional clusterings that you would expect um, uh, it's a, a one, uh, everybody has equal, uh, equal vote. Um, so no, no, your size of budget does not, or uh, does not equate your, your, your sort of your influence within, uh, decision-making. Uh, so really intentional too, about engaging, uh, the municipality or the county within which we work. And then also some of our surrounding, uh, indigenous communities as well. And this is a great size of a group where it's it's large enough that you have a diversity of perspectives, but uh, small enough that you you can make some decisions and set some uh, and set some real direction. And next slide, uh, next slide. And here's the glamour shots of our OHT uh, operations team. They're a wonderful group of people. So just wanted you to have a chance to see them. We have our our lead uh, Amber, uh, two clinical leads, one in primary care, the other in specialty care, and then that's the, the backbone team as a whole um, uh, right there. Next slide. All right, so getting into incorporation, some of the, the things that we're all thinking about. Next slide. Uh, so we, uh, we have, we've had a governance working group since the beginning, but really we've, we reestablished a governance working group for our OHT, really looking at the, the next direction and how we can get ourselves prepared so a little bit about the membership of how we established that. It's sort of like one of those governance nerds unite moments. Like there's a group of people around our OHT table and then those that aren't on the coordinating council that we knew we needed to grab some expertise, uh, people that have been, uh, have incorporated organizations before, have a lot of board experience and really uh, can just sort of effortlessly work through some of the, you know, the myriad of, of considerations. Uh, so grabbed a group, great group of people, brought them together. Our early work plan, uh, really we're just looking at research and the implications of being a not-for-profit corporation, really going through all of the things that Heather went through with us to start. Uh, and one of the things that we landed on or the, the sources of early conversation was around the concept of who the corporate members would be. Uh, and thinking about various, uh, is it is it the member organizations? Is it the citizens at large? Is it patients? You have a, sort of a myriad of, of, of ways that you could think about corporate membership. Is it a blend of all of them? Uh, and really where we landed, to be honest, because we went in so many directions, was 
let's not get too much too far ahead over our skis and, and let's just wait for a little bit uh, a little bit of extra uh, wait for direction before we get too far down the road we're not we weren't even clear if it, if if onco will be the the guiding legislation or if there'll be a new piece of legislation like hospital act that sort of is a purpose built piece of legislation just for uh, ohts so we took, as I said, a let's get prepared, but not get over our skis uh, approach. Um, also have focused a lot on um, our primary care alliance, which has developed and, and the, the role of primary care networks and making sure that we'll be ready to, to jump on that when, when, the time, uh, when the time arises as well. And we also wanted to name some of the things that were important to us uh, when the new, uh, regardless of how much flexibility we have. And one of the things that was most important to us was ensuring that there still remains a really strong patient and family care of a giver voice in our, in our organizations and that we don't become a health service provider dominated um, and we don't lose that, that really important element of, of, our, of our work. Next slide. So some challenges and, and opportunities, uh, just thinking about future state. So uh, Heather sort of alluded to this, but how do we maintain some of the strengths of the main, many different models that we've developed in our local communities because that's what works in our local community while gaining some of the advantages of incorporation. And that really lets us sort of think about what are those advantages of incorporation and what really matters to us. So let's in their effort to standardize, um, let's not throw out what's working in our communities. So that might mean thinking very narrowly about the purpose of the OHT as a, as a corporation. It, you know, is it to just to continue to offer the backbone support and to be uh, an entity that can receive and disperse funds and an entity that can become a health information custodian? Like, why are we incorporated in the first place? What are those very specific reasons? Because I think the unspoken fear we all have is to create another bureaucratic structure, kind of recreate the lens by a different name and then lose all of the advantages of the collective impact work that we've been doing together. And the good news is I think everybody is uh, from the ministry on down to all of us see that and, and wanna make sure that we, we get this right. And then also thinking about the role of the operational support provider in the future. And if, the, if we've got the right operational support provider to take us uh, to where we need to go. And then finally, the last consideration just as a health service uh, uh, executive leader is really preparing our individual health service provider bo boards to really think about how do you balance that duty of loyalty and accountability to your individual organization while also ensuring that we're meeting the needs of the system as a whole. And that might require you to think boards to think differently about how they measure and evaluate their CEOs. Um, my, I'm currently evaluated based on how well my particular silo of care is doing. I have comp compensation tied at risk to individualized um, uh, metrics for our performance. Maybe we wanna stretch our legs a little bit and incent me to also participate and ensure that I'm being a good system leader. So boards really need to think that through, and uh, that's sort of a new and for some maybe an uncomfortable place for them to go. So I think I'll leave it at that, and hopefully we'll have some more great presentations and, and conversation. Thank you. Thanks so much, Scott. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Jeff Powis from the East Toronto, Ontario Health Team. Jeff is an infectious diseases physician and an associate professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Toronto. He's been with Michael Guerin Hospital since 2006, and in addition to clinical care, he was responsible for leading Michael Guerin's pandemic response. After experiencing the collaboration and system alignment that occurred during the pandemic, he took on the role of medical lead for integrated care for the East Toronto Health Partners, that's their OHT, and he's working as the clinical dyad to the OHT executive. Jeff, I'm pleased to pass the baton to you. Thank you, Lauren, and thanks for the opportunity to share our governance journey at East Toronto Health Partners. So I'm going to start my talk with a bit of a caveat. You heard I'm a clinician. I spend most of my days seeing patients, and I would certainly not have joined the uh, Governance Nerds Unite group that Scott mentioned. I'm not by any means a, a governance expert. And so you're going to get a bit different perspective from me than you might from someone else. I usually rely on my co-lead and Wojtek for governance uh, expertise when I have questions about some of the words that you guys are using in your earlier uh, presentations, but what they mean and how might, they might apply to the work we're trying to do as a collective system. Next slide. 
Uh, next slide, please. Oh, you've got it there. Okay, great. No, go back. Thank you. So uh, shortly after our uh, OHT uh, developed, uh, we felt it was important to, to engage uh, outside consultant to help us determine what were the important principles as we expanded our governance and structure over time. And, and so in 2021, we had KPMG look at our OHT through a few different dimensions of governance and provide us with recommendations for best practice with respect to balancing autonomy and integration for partners, clarifying our strategy, strengthening our structures and accountability, defining our core work through portfolios with clear leadership, and addressing decision-making and processes for conflict resolution. And as we've uh, progressed with respect to our governance, we've tried to keep these six principles in mind and keep ourselves in check as we move forward. Next slide, please. Uh, our current state, like many OHTs, is organized by a leadership table. We have uh, eight anchor partners connected through a joint venture agreement. Uh, the anchor table helps guide the vision and the work of the OHT in collaboration with our network of partner organizations, patients, caregivers, and community advisors. And as part of the direction outlined in the path forward, one of the changes that we've made to advance our governance is to add uh, dedicated long-term care home representation. So we opened up our JVA to do so, uh, Chester Village, and then also uh, uh, mental health and addiction sectors to our leadership team. And they joined us in 2023. Next slide. Additional work we've done to try and improve the uh, leadership team is, uh, uh, no, uh, it's not self-promotion, but I, I got added to add the clinical perspective. Um, um, so Anne and I make up the current leadership uh, team. And uh, like Scott mentioned, uh, including uh, medical leadership is really pretty, uh, important to the, in, to, to the work of the OHG, including that medical uh, representation. And so um, I can provide the hospital perspective from a clinician. Um, we are lucky enough to have a primary care network as part of our anchor team. And there are two primary care uh, board members of our uh, primary care network that sit at our anchor table. So they can provide that primary care expertise and leadership, but we don't have a dedicated primary care co-lead because they're embedded within our leadership team. Uh, we have visions uh, to create a, a triad model um, we're currently working with our community advisory committee to look at how the patient caregiver community member might uh, join the current dyad to uh, bring that perspective to the leadership table and voice. Next slide. One of the biggest uh, pieces of work that we've done uh, to progress our, our governance and our work in our OHD is to introduce a, a new portfolio structure. And this has been uh, a great deal of the work that we've done in 2023. We think it's important to keep our work moving forward as we wait for the uh, next steps with respect to incorporation. Um, we felt this was important to better focus our work and provide some transparency around the structure responsibilities and the different roles that partners were providing within our OHT. We've tried as best we could uh, to uh, include a dyad leadership model like we do in our leadership team. The portfolios are divided into those that are priority population and those that are operational acceleration. And you'll note that we do have a governance and corporation uh, team that's gonna be looking at the issue of incorporation. Uh, they are experts, these people, not me, to provide advice as far as how we best proceed with this. We've also tried to design this thinking about integrated care pathways, and many of these portfolios align with where we think the futures will be with respect to integrated care pathways, linking hospital and community-based care for individuals based along disease states. You know, this was a lot of heavy lifting. The earlier feedback from this uh, structure is it has allowed us to, to focus our work. I think it was really important emerging from the pandemic to reinvigorate teams. This has forced a lot of great team building, um, uh, sharing, you know, develop that shared vision around the patients in our community and what's best for them. And uh, we've really tried to narrow people's focus coming out of the pandemic, uh, work together as a team, work on one or two deliverables and not get too distributed in what you're trying to do. Just one of the big struggles when you're trying to do system transformation is looking at too many simultaneous things and not getting anything done. Next slide. The last piece of work that we've done kind of as we advanced our, 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 our team and our governance was to really think about the role of our primary care network. Uh, we've spent a lot of time through government relations to try and push the importance of primary care networks. We personally believe that you know, OHT can't really um, mature without uh, a coexisting and co-maturing primary care network. 
you know, primary care is really at the core of integrated health and social care uh, systems. And I, I don't think we can have a mature OHT without a mature primary care network. And they're going to uh, coexist and co-mature in, 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 in parallel. Next slide. So as a clinician kind of entering in this world of uh, governance and OHTs, there's just some of my reflections and I'm fascinated to hear from our greater Hamilton colleagues to see if the corporation has dealt with some of these challenges that I've noted since joining the team. The first is that uh, having difficult conversations in the current model is challenging. And uh, if we really wanna have system transformation, we're gonna have to have some difficult conversations around resource uh, sharing. And I think right now, some of those conversations are really challenging in the current governance model. Um, despite everything we try, and I'm sure you all struggle with this, there continues to be frustration with multiple organizations, the bureaucracy that that, uh, that that produces. Despite having templates for OHT and other tools to make things efficient, they still are inefficient. And uh, particularly when it comes to funding, labor, and privacy, we keep getting caught up over and over again, and that delays uh, intervention and uh, initiatives. Um, I mean, in fact, the ministry thinks OHTs can do anything with the budget they provided is astounding. Uh, there's no money in the OHT to do all the work that needs to be done. And uh, really, I think we need to think about how OHTs uh, get their juice to do the work. And uh, I've noted that much of the uh, investment from partners in the OHT is done in kind and not even with dedicated resources, but often something people do in addition to the regular job off the side of their desk. And if we really wanna see our OHTs advance, we're gonna to have to put more juice into it to get it done. And the last frustrating point is that sometimes ministry funding pr proposals have a promoted fragmentation. A great example is the 30 million call for primary care expansion. I went out to premier care teams to submit EOIs. And so ROHT submitted many EOIs. Um, if you really wanted to promote integration through an OHT, it could have come to the OHT. We would provide it out to our premier care teams then vet the responses and submit the best ones to the ministry aligned with their priorities and with our own priorities. Speaking to my clinical colleagues, sorry, next slide. I asked them a little bit about what, what do they want from an OHT governance moving forward. Uh, people work in the hospital, people work in the community, and these are what they've told me. They want clear um, strategy and priorities. They want to know what their role is and uh, what others' roles is, and that clearly delineated with uh, subsequent responsibilities. They wanted to see their voice represented in the OHT so that they had an opportunity to provide that strategy and direction that the future board would uh, potentially provide. And clarity on process, uh, not, not really uh, when times are good, but more for when times are bad or when they want to induce change. And this is what most clinicians said to me they wanted when they were thinking about an OHT governance. And I'm sure we're all at the same stage where we're kind of in this in between. We've been told there's some great present coming with non-for-profit, but nobody knows what, when, or how. And there's a huge opportunity cost for us to sit and wait for this change. I'm sure all of you are similarly conflicted about how long we wait before we uh, move forward. Um, so I'll stop there and pass it on to my uh, next uh, colleague speaker. Thanks very much, Jeff. Our final speaker today is Melissa McCallum. Melissa is the first executive director of the Greater Hamilton Health Network, which is notable for being the first, and I believe still only, incorporated Ontario Health Team. As a trailblazer in this area with about a year of experience in operation before the province's path forward announcement, uh, we're very eager to hear Melissa's experience and lessons learned for our own future input. Melissa. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks everyone for having me. Um, I think I wanted to first start off with who we are as an OHT. Uh, the Greater Hamilton Health Network was one of the first Ontario health teams in the province to be approved in November of 2019. We have a very large attributed population of about 700,000 residents that span three geographical regions. That's Hamilton, Haldimand, and Niagara Northwest. We also support individuals from Mississaugas of the Credit and Six Nations of the Grand River. So considerations for on-reserve and in urban Indigenous care are, are very important. And when we look to our population, you know, there's a mix of characteristics being both a rural and urban OHT, you know, we see lack of transportation, very, very high areas of material deprivation and poverty, a growth in seniors, 
Uh, and, you know, like the rest of the province, mental health and addictions uh, is a significant local health burden. And the lack of supportive housing, poverty and homelessness uh, and an opiate crisis are all really, you know, pressuring our communities. Uh, next slide, please. Our journey to date um, was a bit different in that, you know, when the OHT concept was first announced, Hamilton did apply to become an Ontario health team as just Hamilton, the Hamilton health team. Uh, we were approved as just a Hamilton health team proper. During the pandemic, the ministry uh, formally asked us to integrate with another two areas uh, where it didn't make much sense to have smaller OHTs where patients were actually utilizing services within Hamilton. So we were asked to formally integrate Haldimand and uh, Niagara Northwest into the Hamilton Ontario Health Team. It was at that time in June of 2021, we actually rebranded to be the Greater Hamilton Health Network to reflect that full geography. And then December of 2021, uh, we become the first incorporated OHT in the province. So yes, we are uh, right now the first and only uh, not-for-profit entity. I do just want to say this has been our journey and our experience so far. I think that there are definitely local nuances to take into account. Uh, and nothing is perfect, uh, but this is uh, kind of why we went this route far beyond, far before, um, you know, it was thought about. So next slide, please. So the most common question is, you know, why did you want to do this? Um, you know, there's a CDMA, there was guidance already there for Ontario health teams to work together. But honestly, we felt that we already had mature partnerships in the region. Before the OHT concept was even announced, we had anchor partners talking about the concept of an Ontario health team uh, and how we could make that happen here locally. Uh, we knew that an incorporation and much to Heather's presentation provided us a lot more structure and accountability. You know, how were we gonna make decisions across so many different sectors and providers? We wanted the ability to have autonomy in operations, receive funds, procure, hire, and deliver service. An incorporation and a board of directors is a model that organizations are already familiar with. You know, so how could we progress that within the OHT, you know, concept? So um, this is our current, you know, can you just go to the next slide? Sorry. I just want to see. Yeah, we'll start here. So the inputs to our governance work um, were really threefold. In 2020, we started off with a small consultation with Ernst & Young about just understanding the models of governance. You know, what made sense when we're working across municipalities and healthcare providers? Uh, it was at that point that they recommended a few models for consideration. We then did six months worth of a health equity consultation and formal report. You know, we um, wanted to make a commitment in our OHT from the very beginning to serve those that have experienced barriers to healthcare, but also have a board that reflected a diversity matrix that served our communities. And then we went out to our partner organizations in the summer of 2021, you know, to, you know, report back on this information and understand kind of, you know, where are you worried about? Where do you think that there's positives? Next slide. Centering around health equity was actually very important uh, for a number of reasons. We wanted to deliver care to patients from that lens, but we also wanted to operate and have a governance structure that reflected the needs of our community. I think that, you know, many times when people were coming together, we weren't fully understanding the diversity of our community and having that matrix sitting at the governance, you know, table at the board of directors and making strategic decisions about our community was very important from the outset. Next slide. So we created a health equity report that helped us guide not only you know, key recommendations for an equitable health agenda, but how we were going to ensure that our board, as we create a new organization, was reflecting the care that our community needed. And remember in that first slide, our community needs a lot of focus on those that are more marginalized and vulnerable. People are dying, you know, people are being, you know, are getting sick because we have a system that doesn't entirely feel safe and equitable. Uh, and we know that racism makes people feel ill. So how were we going to, you know, progress an organization with that lens from the very beginning? So we had a unique opportunity to center around health equity. Next slide. After those two reports were done, we went back out to our partners. 
This was led by the OHT staff in the summer of 2021, and we reported back on the findings of both of those reports. We allowed partners to understand the model and the implications. And really the biggest question was, how will this affect my funding right now? How is this going to affect my own board? We actually felt um, at the end of the partner consultations that there was a lot less fear about the model than we had expected. And I'm not sure exactly why. Maybe it was because, you know, partners were really used to working together in a different way through COVID. Um, but we, we really saw this positivity towards, you know, something different and something more meaningful in an integrated way for our community. Next slide. So in terms of decision making, we do have an 18 uh, seat board, 15 directors are nominated by a class or stakeholder council. There are three independent director seats to fill out skills, competency, diversity. Directors are not coming on behalf of their organization, but on the behalf of the health of the entire community. This is about the patients that we serve. And there is a broad range of stakeholders and community members at the board. This is just a snippet of um, some of the working groups, the board sitting there at the top. We do have four formal stakeholder councils uh, that do elect members to the board. Uh, four groups that we found were extremely important, like, like primary care, like health equity, also ensuring that because we amalgamated with another region, ensuring that their uh, voice was being you know, heard at the strategic and decision-making table of the board. And underneath there, those are just five of probably about 10 secretariat working groups that we have in terms of priority populations. Next slide. This is an outline of our current board structure. Um, you'll see there is that mix of sector representation, um, council representation, patients, uh, ensuring that we have diversity of uh, Francophone and Indigenous members and then three independent seats that we fill out as well. As of right now, we have 14 of the 18 members sitting on the board. You know, what have we accomplished so far? Um, you know, Jeff, back to your point, we are really proud that uh, we actually handed in one primary care EOI for our whole entire OHT catchment area which to be honest, for those who work in primary care um, was uh, an incredible feat uh, and something that we are very, very, very proud of. And I'm not sure that would have been accomplished if we weren't already thinking in this way where we are strategic planning across sectors at that level. So that was a huge win. But on top of that, we've also, you know, managed multiple shared funding opportunities that have been passed through the board, including community sector funding, lower limb projects, 16 digital health um, funding opportunities. Some of these new formal stakeholder councils that have a relationship to the board have been um, really helpful. You know, having that uh, that mindset, that health equity and patient voice, you know, being front and center has felt new and different to our organizations. I will say that the strategic planning uh, feels completely cross-sectoral. We've also done shared advocacy in January. We released a gender-affirming care position as part of a whole entire sector uh, across the gin. So, you know, how do we advocate as a group of providers together for equitable care? That's extremely important. And we've started to do that work. And again, there's shared resourcing for integrated projects. Our partners are stepping up to the plate where they need to, where we have, you know, shared vision, shared strategic planning, you know, making sure that boards are thinking about how does your organization, you know, lean into OHT planning has been really, really important. Next slide. Just my key messages, you know, individuals are not members, but they're part of stakeholder councils and the working groups of the GIN. I do want to say that any organization can be part of our work. This is extremely important because we know that there are small, you know, not-for-profits, community church groups. You know, we need the continuum of care at the working group level. We also need the continuum of care, you know, at that decision-making level as well. So ensuring that we the municipalities, social organizations, health, public health, small and large organizations are represented. And as you know, you know, for boards right now, funding and accountability remains in place as per their ministry agreements. But what we are working on engagement agreements. We can't call them membership agreements according to the legislation, but what's the code of conduct, you know, to be part of an OHT as a member? And last slide, you know, just in terms of my key learnings through this, I am not a governance uh, guru. I 
I'm a nurse by background. Uh, this has been, you know, an incredible learning opportunity, but it is resource intensive. It's not only in that development, but we're still implementing this model. And it's it's complicated with more partners. Over the last month, we've um, secured HIROC insurance, but we're looking to understand how do we become a health information custodian? How do we become a health service provider? The whole process created opportunities for dialogue in a different way. Um, we're thinking in a more shared, collaborative way. It 100% created trust amongst uh, the organizations. But again, it's a work in progress. It takes money and staff time. Um, and we're working towards you know, uh, other mechanisms like making our board meetings public, continuous community engagement, and being transparent that you know, this is the fit for purpose right now. Uh, the, the purpose of this organization and the board might change in the years to come as we see you know, new things evolve and, and new announcements. Um, so that's all I think, Lauren, thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And, and thank you again to all of our speakers today. We have only a few very short minutes to address some questions now, and we're going to start with those that were submitted ahead of the event. Um, Scott, you spoke of the need to ensure that we can continue the collaborative approach that's existing today um, once this more formal and hierarchical structure of a corporation is instituted. So I think this one is best suited for you. Uh, do you have any suggestions of how this can be achieved? Specifically, how can the diverse partner agencies continue to directly participate in decision making once there is a single board of directors that governs the OAT in a more traditional manner? Yeah, that will be the trick. I think that a lot of the leadership councils that we've established, or in our case, the coordinating council, just the purpose will shift. There'll be there'll be executive leaders that will need to be advising on strategy up to their boards, but also showing good servant leadership uh, to their individual organizations and clusters to be able to do the change management that needs to occur. So it's it's a it's a governance of implementation, governance of a management team, uh, and that interplay between the board and, and that executive leadership. So still going to the best the best uh, stuff happens when leadership is working effectively, regardless of the structure. So we all need to keep tuning that and working on that now in the interim as we wait for the corporate structure to emerge. Amazing, thank you, and and on that note. Um, and considering what Heather was saying, broader responsibility to the system as a whole. Um, Heather, do you have any suggestions of how directors, the board of directors for the OHT uh, might be able to, to navigate an expanded role of having their obligations and acting in the best interests of their own organizations, but also uh, to the system uh, more at large in terms of identifying opportunities to integrate with others and provide more coordinated care. Thanks, Lauren. Um, so this question of alignment between the best interests of a not-for-profit um, health service provider, HSP board, and the best interests of the broader system and partners, it's not a new question. Um, so it's not new to OHTs. And the requirement in the Connecting Care Act that HSPs um, identify opportunities to integrate um, and provide integrated care is also not new. Um, it was in the predecessor uh, legislation, the Local Health System Integration Act. Um, so this is something um, that has been a challenge, but also an opportunity. Um, and from our perspective as lawyers, we would say acting in the best interests of a not-for-profit HSP already means taking into account the organization's multiple accountabilities, right? Uh, stakeholders, funders, regulators, others, which by definition is gonna bring in the broader system perspective. Um, and over the years, you might've seen a diagram like this or um, sort of a de depiction of these multiple stakeholders, right? And especially in the context of a not-for-profit corporation, it's not just a, a you know accountability to shareholders. There is this broader set of stakeholders. Um, so acting in the best interests of the um, health service provider also means taking other health service providers in the general community and the broader community into account in their interests. And by and large, like it's going to be likely that everybody's interests share a lot in common, right? Um, health service providers are interested in better outcomes, right? Better integration. 
um, and so on. And, and, and so what's in the interest of one HSP is likely to be in the interests of others. Um, will there be situations where interests conflict? Yes, probably there will be. Um, some might be managed by tools that are currently available to funders and regulators, right? Legislative sort of carrots and sticks, balanced budget requirements, integration provisions, that sort of thing. Um, also the law applicable to not-for-profit corporations and for-profit corporations and your governing documents when you're incorporated will prescribe certain rules that'll need to be followed in respect of conflicts and managing them, right? Um, and I think the potential for this issue is likely to be taken into account when designing a governance framework for OHTs, either ministry guidance, OH guidance, or just the process of developing that um, in your local team, taking into account those accountabilities um, and how to manage when there's a potential conflict. Um, and there's a concept at corporate law at large, right, of this conflict of duty and duty, when you owe duties, uh, fiduciary duties to different entities, and there are ways of managing it. Um, you know, again, like most of this could be its own presentation, but that gives you a bit of a flavor. Thanks, Heather. And, and looking at the clock, I'm afraid that's actually all the questions we have time for today but our panelists have indicated that they'd be glad to answer any other questions. If you'd like to reach out to them after the event, uh, contact information is up on the screen as well as, as well as the contact information for Catherine, Nicole, and myself. So we encourage you to reach out. And as things continue to evolve, um, we may host another event in the future, so stay tuned. For now, I'll pass it back to Catherine Nickel to close us out for today. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren, for moderating and for being the creative brain behind both of our events. Thanks very much to our panelists, Heather Scott, Jeff, and Melissa. We really appreciate you sharing your knowledge and experiences. Um, I'd like to take one minute and share with you some of the gems I picked up from our fellow OHT leaders. So Scott, let's get prepared, but let's not get out over our skis. Let's not throw out what's working well in individual communities. The best stuff happens when leadership is working effectively, regardless of structure. And let's think about how to incent executives to be good system leaders. Uh, Jeff, let's make, make sure to think about coexisting and co-maturing primary care networks. How do we put more juice into OHTs? And good governance means representation, seeing oneself in the OHT direction. And Melissa, let's think about what it takes to fully understand the diversity of a community and the impact on governance. Stakeholder councils that report into a board are a good strategy to keep work moving and the full continuum of care needs to be at the decision making table. I hope I did you justice. Um, special thanks to VHA's communication team for helping out in the background and a special thanks to all of our uh, guests here today for joining us. I really hope that you found it uh, informative and, and as interesting as I did. And in thinking about the right way to close us off, uh, one of my favorite medical authors, Atul Gawand, I'm sure many of you have read Atul Gawand. I was introduced to his writing in 2010 when he did opening remarks at a conference I was at. Uh, his recent book, uh, Being Mortal, is focused on how we need to rethink end of life care to be about autonomy, connection and quality. But his earlier books were all about performance and striving for better, for improving the health care, uh, system and for uh, uh, improving care overall. So exactly what we are all very focused on today. So he had a quote and his quote is, better is possible. It does not take genius. It takes diligence. It takes moral clarity. It takes ingenuity. And above all, it takes a willingness to try. So today we can close off being reassured that there is no doubt that we are all trying diligently with moral clarity, with ingenuity, and certainly with a willingness to try. And personally, I'm very glad to be doing it alongside all of you. So I wish you a wonderful rest of the afternoon and let's hope we come back with another opportunity to be together. Thank you. <laughs>